Welcome to the Caregiver Reality Show with your hosts, David Levy and Paul Badiato, who bring you more than a combined 25 years of practical experience, helping thousands of family caregivers, helping them find solutions to the challenges and frustrations presented by this important responsibility. So if you are in the position of caring for a spouse or a parent, a loved one who is no longer able to care for themselves, or if you know someone who is, this hour will be worth the listening. Now, let's tune into today's edition of Caregiver Reality with your hosts, David Levy and Paul Vadiato. Good evening, South Florida, America, and the world. It's another Drive Time Tuesday, and this is the Caregiver Reality Hour. I'm your host, David Levy. I'm here with my co host, Paul Vadiato, and you're listening to us on caregiverreality.com, WWNN 1470 Radio AM here in our own backyard. WWNNRadio.com, iHeartRadio, Amp2.tv, and eventually everything that Twitters tweets and gets out on YouTube, iTube, or wherever it may be, you have no excuse not to hear us. If not tonight, then at some point in the next week. And our audience is growing. It numbers in the millions. And um, we're very pleased to see that we've made a difference in engaging caregivers to change, to be reactive to what's happening to them, and to recognize that they are the backbone of the American, probably, and the worldwide healthcare system. Because there's nobody else coming in your home, 724, to take care of your loved one, except you, the family caregiver, spouse, daughter, son, significant other, or friend who has decided to sacrifice their time to help another person have a better quality of life, but they have to do it at home in a non-clinical setting, and we are their advocates. So sit back and listen. We've got a great show for you tonight. We have a tremendous guest. His name is Brian Langdon, and Brian is the, pardon me for reading, the national spokesperson for the long-term and disability income for Ash Brokerage, one of the largest in the country with upwards of 10,000 agents out there, all bringing you quality insurance products to ensure your quality of life as you grow older. And he has a lot of important things to say tonight that I know you need to listen to, you need to take to heart. If you think you've heard it before, you haven't. Brian is just an expert on the subject. He's not here to sell you, he's here to educate you. And we look forward to a conversation with him just as soon as we've heard Paul's perspective and we take care of a little commercial business. So, Paul, how was your week in caregiving? Well, good afternoon, David, and good afternoon to all of you out there. I hope you had a good week. Uh, my week in caregiving, uh, I guess the only way I can relate that would be to if you ever had a car that was making noises and was having trouble, and you finally got it into the dealership and they take the car in and they say, we ran all the tests, we went out and we don't hear anything, it's fine. That was my week in caregiving because Debbie's been having such problems. We've been to the specialists, we've been imaged to death and uh, they can't put fingers on exactly what's happening. I mean, I am grateful that nothing so catastrophic has been found but in terms of caregiving uh, boy it's frustrating and how about Suzette? Well there hasn't been a good week for Suzette yesterday uh, we went and we found an allergist who actually understands dysautonomia and she knew who the leading person for dysautonomia was a doctor by the name of Blair Grubb at the Medical College of Ohio where Suzette trained and who she sees or has seen. It's not so easy to get to Ohio these days. But uh, she was very thorough. I was very pleased. She took her off a bunch of medicine. She put her on some others. But she was very careful to say, when I take you off of this and I substitute that, here's the reason. Here's the side effect you may have. But this is going to give you some of the relief that you're looking for. And it was such a delight to have a conversation with a doctor that not only understood their subject of allergies, but also understood dysautonomia. It was a rare find. And um, so she was very pleased. Um, 
we're waiting for the rest of her medication to come in. We are now in double-digit medication. Welcome to the club. Yeah, well, I'm not happy about that. And I'm going to see one of our friends who is a similar to Steve Chalker, who was on the other night for uh, Pops Pharmacy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have a discussion about what it is that we can eliminate, reduce, change, change around, because I'm getting confused with the meds. I got them all marked on the tops, on the bottoms, what happens when and where. But it's getting to be overwhelming, and I'm not sure that we're not compounding the problem by making chemical soup with all the stuff that we're taking. So hasn't been a good week, but at least we got some answers to some of the problems, and uh, we'll go from there. Paul, since I know that uh, you've got to go up to Philadelphia next week, because yes. I know because I'm lending you a warm coat. That's right. Paul's been down here for so long that he gave it away to the thrift store. So I'm lending a month. I just hope it comes with direction so I know how to wear it. No, but what it does come with is a bottle of Tums in the pocket. Thank you. All right, so you're all set for the aggravation you're going to find in Philly. <laughs> but it's time to do from my perspective. And Paul? Thank you, David. What are you complaining about this week? Well, I, I want to speak today on something that I am extraordinarily passionate about and I'm real. I really feel wounded by what is happening by this, and I am going to apologize a ahead because some of this I do want to read so that you can get the full flavor and understanding of what ha what's happening. And it's on the right to die. Currently, uh, uh, Miss Christine White is battling cancer, and she is now suing the state of California in court for what she says is her right to die on her terms. This is a quote from her. To help me achieve a peaceful and dignified death at the place and time of my choosing were the words that she had used at a recent news conference. Ms. White has had leukemia or lymphoma since 2007, has undergone rounds of chemotherapy, radiation, and has had a bone marrow transplant. Though she is in partial remission right now, she has seen friends with terminal diseases who would have liked to have had that option to have aid in dying in California. In that lawsuit, she was joined by four other physicians, including her own, who want the right to administer aid in dying treatment without penalty. And of those physicians, two of the four of them, they themselves have a terminal illness so they are speaking both from a personal and a professional perspective. This, it, this brings up, you might remember, the case of Brittany Maynard, who also originally lived in California, whose decision with Die With Dignity brought her to a decision that she had to uproot her family and move to the state of Oregon, where it is currently legal. It was with great pain and with great uh, cost for her to relocate and Oregon is only one of three states that has that right to choose uh, the other two are uh, Washington and New Hampshire excuse me Vermont there are judicial decisions right now in Montana and New Mexico that authorize doctors to prescribe fatal drugs under certain circumstances but these rulings have not come down into law Ms. Maida, you might remember, died in uh, November of 2014 of brain cancer. California law now states regarding assisted suicide, and I quote, every person who deliberately aids or, or advises or encourages another to commit suicide is guilty of a felony. The physicians are seeking a declaration to administer dying aid to mentally competent, terminally ill adults without having criminal liability. In four previous attempts in California, it has failed to pass legislation regarding end-of-life options on dying. And the argument that some of the opponents are using is that first, it is, a, it is morally wrong, but secondly, it might encourage insurance companies to prey upon the most vulnerable victims. Uh, where the goal is actually to end a life without quality. Uh, 
But anyway, back to the lawsuit. It's being argued that the opponents are using fear as their main weapon in, in preventing this from happening. In order to qualify, patients would have to overcome many obstacles and safeguards. These treatments would only apply to a small group of people anyway. So far, California's Attorney General has not overturned the law nor has made any comment. So from my perspective, we should have a right to decide what we want to do with our lives, our bodies, if we do it with knowledge, competency, and with no harm to others. We go to physicians to get relief from suffering. In terminal cases where there is no quality of life, we think that this treatment option should be available to all. David? Well, this is a subject we've discussed on a number of occasions. And I think that we have to be very careful where we trample here. We are, we are having other people's morality, be it religious or what have you, imposed on people who are the ones who are suffering. And many religions take a very strong position about suicide. And if you are of that religious persuasion, then you can follow whatever it is your mm -hmm. religious dictates are. If I am not of that religious persuasion, then I do not want you interfering with the quality or the, the ability of me to decide what I may want in my pain and suffering when it comes to end of life. There was a gentleman we talked about on the radio show not very long ago, 39 years old, had Duchenne's uh, dystrophy and is a terminal illness. And he was making the same argument that when it came time, he wanted to be able to go gently into the night. And he said, for 39 years, I have made every decision in my life that I had to make. Why should I not, at this particular point in time, with something as important as my pain and suffering, and whether I want to be here, not be able to make that decision because somebody else is sitting on high and judging me from a standard that I don't necessarily subscribe to? And as we've talked about, the Hippocratic Oath, which is always thrown into the mix, which is do no harm, do not hasten, is one of those things like the Ten Commandments. It's been handed down historically and is not a requirement of medical licensure. It's not a requirement of being board certified. It simply is an ethical standard put forward thousands of years ago that in many situations works for clarity. But when you talk to ethicists, and I'm talking about many of the people that we've had on the show, bioethicists, uh, Vicki Kind, and we get into the subject of whether or not one has the right, if they are competent, to make a decision as to whether they want to continue their pain and suffering because somebody else, either because of liability or because of their particular persuasion on how they view taking your life, we're being victimized. And Paul, I agree with you. Everybody should have that right if they are competent, if they put it in writing, if it's been clearly expressed by them, their family, their doctors understand it. Why should it be any different than any other medical decision that we are asked to make? Why is it when it comes to end of life we get so overboard on what we're allowed to do with our own bodies? It's one thing to say you're incompetent. And then for a while we had this wonderful standard that they tried to impose out in Oregon before they got straightened out, was if you wanted to commit suicide, you needed the approval of two psychiatrists. Now, tell me a psychiatrist who is going to say that somebody who wishes to take their life, regardless of their suffering, is competent to make that decision. So you are already trapped in the enigma of having right. medical formality rule as to whether or not you can make a personal decision. There's nothing that stops us today from getting a gun, a bottle, pills, alcohol, whatever it is, and taking our lives. And people go, oh, poor dear. Why is it that we can't have that same thing occur when we are in a desperate end-of-life situation with pain and suffering and no quality of life to look forward David, to? David, I would ask our listeners and our viewers to go to our Facebook page, Caregiver Reality. 
let us know what you think. Where do you stand on this issue? Or if this is something that perhaps is going on within your family, the kind of situations that you have had as you discuss this with your family, with your doctors, and with uh, other providers. David? Yeah, and uh, I think we've covered that subject for the moment because we're never going to get to a clear answer. No, it's a not. very personal subject, and it, it is affected by all the things that we just discussed. However, I want to further now take uh, a little bit of a commercial break. I want to thank Pops Pharmacy, one of our newest sponsors, and Steve Chalker. He uh, came to our rescue last week uh, when my wife needed uh, specially compounded medication. He went out of his way to get the paperwork into the doctor, to get the medication compounded, and before the sun set, the medication was ready to be delivered. I had to go over there in the morning, so I picked it up, but it was there. I can only tell you that Pops, located in Deerfield on 2nd Avenue, just north of Hillsborough Boulevard, just south of City Hall, is absolutely a family-friendly neighborhood pharmacy with caring people. You cannot do better than to deal with Pops. And Steve is just a phenomenal doctor of pharmacy who will take the time to explain to you what's going on with your medication, advise you as to whether or not there may be complications with those meds and other meds that you may be taking. You can reach him at 754-227-7252. That's Steve Chalker at Pops Pharmacy. They're great people. I use them myself, and believe me, I don't use people that I don't think are the best, and I would never advise anybody to use somebody that I use unless I really thought they were doing a great job. But find out for yourself. Give Steve a call, 754-227-7252, and get that level of pharmaceutical excellence that we all want to have, whether you're buying over-the-counter, whether you're buying a compounded med, or just a typical prescription that goes from one bottle to the next. They're great people. They want to help. And give them a call, 754-227-7252. And while we're on the subject so that we can get to our guest, who I'm waiting very anxiously to speak with, I want to tell you a little bit more about Senior Citizens Bureau. Senior Citizens Bureau, located from Houston, Texas, but around the corner uh, in many, many locations, uh, they have 650,000 members out there, all young, active seniors. I like to think all of us are young, active seniors, even you, Paul. And they really make a difference. They've got a very caring, sharing organization that solves problems, deals with your issues. They've got phone numbers that you can call. You can ask questions of them at info at SeniorCitizensBureau.com. That's info at SeniorCitizensBureau.com. You can call them at 1-800-281-1088. Uh, That's 1-800-281-1088. They're going to be opening a, uh, a senior citizen's location here in South Florida. I'm helping them do it. And in light of full disclosure, I'm also chairman of the board, but I went on to the organization because I thought that they were doing an excellent job, that we in the media here could lend a hand that we have an opportunity to help them grow, and that uh, we also have an opportunity, because of some of my prior experience, to help them open an even more comprehensive, caregiver-focused phone center that will be able to deal not only with people's individual issues, but those of the caregiver. And they are a great organization. Check them out. SeniorCitizensBureau.com. Look at the website, info at SeniorCitizensBureau dot com, ask a question, or call them at 1-800-281-1088. And uh, we're now going to move to uh, back to our guest, or to our guest, Brian Langdon, National Spokesman for the Long-Term Care and Disability Income for Ash Insurance Brokerage, a major national brokerage dealing in long-term care insurance. And Brian's got a lot of great insight into what's going on out there and what you need to do to protect you and your loved one, not just for today, because things never happen today, but what's happening tomorrow and how you need to prepare for it. So let's move over and have a conversation. Wonderful. Are you a family caregiver? 
Are you taking care of a spouse or loved one who can no longer take care of himself or herself? Are you dealing with Alzheimer's disease and don't know what to do? Do you feel burned out, frustrated, and just don't know where to turn? You've tried doctors, lawyers, and mental health professionals and have come to realize that they don't have practical answers to these questions. What you need are experts, non-clinical family caregivers with 25 years of active experience helping thousands of family caregivers like yourself. People who can help you provide a better quality of life for yourself and your loved one. Who you need are David Levy or Paul Vadiato. Reach David at david at caregiverreality.com or reach Paul at paul at caregiverreality.com and let them help you pick the right path towards improving the quality of life for you, the caregiver, and your loved one. This is Paul Vadiato, co-host of the Caregiver Reality Hour. Be sure to join us Tuesdays at 5 p.m., 1470 a.m. on your radio dial, iHeartRadio, or live stream on caregiverreality.com slash live show. Be sure to visit us on our website, caregiverreality.com, and like us on Facebook. Join the conversation. This is Caregiver Reality with gerontologist David Levy and caregiver expert Paul Vadiato, who asks you to call in and speak with him on the air toll free at 888 565 1470. That's 888 565 1470 to share a story or important information. Now, back to today's Caregiver Reality Show. And we're back, and it's uh, the second half of the Caregiver Reality Hour. Paul and I have finished all of the remonstrances that we have to do, and now we can move on to our guest, Brian Langdon. As I said, he is the man, Ash Insurance. Why don't you just tell us very quickly for those that are trying to figure out what is Ash Insurance? Paul has all the questions, but I'm just curious for you to give us a good descriptor. Sure. The best way to describe Ash as, as a distributor. Um, insurance company manufacture the products. What ASH does is distribu uh, we distribute the products throughout the country, uh, working with a network of almost 10,000 advisors from coast to coast. Okay, that's a pretty simple explanation. And uh, how many other organizations are out there the size of ASH? Oh, the size of ASH, very few, uh, maybe about a handful. Okay. And, um, and you specialize in strictly long-term care? Well, we specialize in life insurance, annuities, uh, long-term care and disability income. I've uh, been in business since 1974. Uh, Family-owned out of Fort Wayne, Indiana, of about 350 employees nationwide. All right. Paul, all yours. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. And Brian, thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. Uh, having been in the wealth management world for 29 years, I very familiar with long-term care. I own it myself, as does my wife, and it's been uh, an important part of most of our clients uh, who we've had during the years. And interestingly enough, I think it's so misunderstood, Brian, that it's often considered to be an expense rather than an asset, which it truly is. Why do, you, why do, we, clarify, why do we characterize it as an asset, Brian? Well, we char uh, characterize it as an asset because it sets aside a rather large sum of income tax-free money to help take care for an event that we, as we all discussed, that as you get older, you most certainly are going to have, especially as a couple, if you get a couple into their 80s, uh, the odds of one of them needing some kind of substantial long-term care is very high. I, well, will I will tell you one thing. If you had been at my support group this morning at uh, Alzheimer's Spouses, they're all in their 70s with that significant event. Believe me, it doesn't wait till 80. Yeah. Brian, I've been reading numbers that say the, the, the cost of care in retirement could be as much as 40% of the budget, and that's not even including uh, long-term incapacity. Uh, that could truly wreck your retirement. It really could, and, and what I often counsel individuals to think about is is setting aside a long-term care event or monies for a long-term care event. Think about what you might need at, at age 75, 80, 85 mm -hmm. uh, to pay for it. 
you know, we tend to think in terms of what the cost is today. But I think it's very important to uh, game out 5, 10, 15, 20 years and think about what that cost is going to grow to and how it could have a devastating impact to the savings that you've created over a 30, 40, 50 year period of time. Well, insurance or long-term care insurance is actually transferring that risk to a, a third party. And I know, and you gave some examples before, what are some of the, the products that allow uh, an insured uh, to spread that risk to somebody else and, and still have some options? Well, traditionally, and for the longest time in long-term care, we had what, what I would call a traditional long-term care product that I would usually describe as something like your homeowners. A traditional long-term care product, you would uh, transfer the risk to an insurance company. Uh, they would agree to hold a large or a substantial sum in case you got sick. Um, frankly, you would hope that you would never need it. Um, but in today's world, you have a, a variety of different options. You do still have that traditional long-term care. You have the ability to take life insurance, combine it with long-term care so that if you don't ever use the long-term care insurance, the life insurance would pay back the estate, income tax-free. You can combine annuities in long-term care so that you use an annuity chassis, typical annuity that, that uh, many folks have. But if you get sick and you have a long-term care need, then you gross the amount up two or three times uh, to provide the coverage. And finally, uh, we have a number of life insurance companies who are adding and providing a rider to your life insurance that would allow you to draw down the face amount dollar for dollar should you need long-term care. All four options work exactly the same way. The benefits are income tax-free, uh, but it provides you a, a variety, and I often tell advisors that long-term care has gone from a purchase process to a planning process. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. When, when we think about insurance, long-term care insurance, we know that it has a cost to buy it, and part of that is to have the health good enough to get it. But there's really a price for not having it. And why don't you address that a little bit, because I'm sure you've seen quite a bit of it in your years. Well, I have, and, and just so um, we had this discussion a little bit earlier, uh, I never advocate that you have to buy long-term care, but you should have a plan. But the, the impact to a family if you don't have a plan or don't have the long-term care insurance goes far past uh, just the pure cost of it. Uh, you put the family in a particularly difficult situation as they try to figure out how to fund your care. Um, many policies in today's world provide care coordination, which helps you find that right caregiver, uh, maybe the right care facility. Um, but we all know that when a loved one needs uh, caregiving, that the stress level in that family goes through the roof. And would it be much better for a family to have a plan in place as opposed to trying to plan after an event has occurred? Well, we couldn't agree with you more. And when we recognize when you use the word caregiver, Mm -hmm. that there's a distinction between a paid caregiver that you may be able to purchase or obtain through your policy, but long term and over the mountains and through the woods, it's usually a family member, a spouse, a daughter who gets in the trenches 724 and provides that unpaid family caregiving to a point where it can affect their health their well-being and, and even their economic security sure. because they may have to quit work to do for mom that which they never planned to do. So I can certainly see where the, in, the right insurance product can at least take some of the pressure off of making good decisions without having that economic sword hanging over your head. Well, if I, if I could very quickly sure. share a story of my mm -hmm. own family. Um, years ago after my father's second bypass surgery, a number of days after he was out of the hospital, uh, he had some complications, but not quite at the level that the hospital would take him back. So my mother called me and asked me to come down to help provide care. I lived five hours away. Um, I had three brothers within 15 minutes of the house. But I grew up in a very traditional family. So I was the oldest. Oh. So I was expected to, to come home. And she, when she called, she said, your father will let you take care of him, and he'll let me take care of him. 
So I did what any son would do. I said, I'll be there tomorrow. Um, came down. My mother took the days. I took the nights. Um, but as each night, as I, as I tried to, to clean him up, um, I would try to continue to have a dialogue with him uh, to put him at ease. And uh, see, my father was the principal of the high school that I and my brothers went to. He was well known in the community, um, well respected. Um, but one night, as, as we were going through the process, I noticed he was staring out at the window, and uh, it hit me like a bolt of lightning. My father's dignity had been completely stripped away uh, at that moment in his life. Um, and, and that moment always stayed with me. Uh, a couple of weeks later, I was home for uh, a visit, or a couple of months for, for Thanksgiving. I was relaying the story with my mother, and she said, you know you need to go in and talk to your father about it. And I said, yeah, I'm a little uncomfortable. And we didn't do that a lot in my family. She really encouraged me to do so. I went in and talked to my father. And I said, hey, Pop, I'd like to talk to you about that time that you were sick. And just to let you know that I'd always be there for you. And he was reading the newspaper. And, and after a while, he put the newspaper down. And he looked at me and he said, son, you seem to think about uh, that this is about you. This is not about you. It's about me and how I choose to live my life. And if I have to live a life where my son takes care of me as I did for him when he was a child, it's a life I choose not to live. And he put the newspaper up and never spoke about it again. Wow. That's a very strong individual and very uh, fiercely independent. Yes. And you can remember it if it was yesterday. Oh, um, every day. Yeah. And your, and your other brothers, where did they eventually fit, fit into the mix? Well, um, what did they learn from this? Here's what I took away from it. And I have, um, uh, my brothers are all very successful. Um, one is an attorney, he's a litigator. And as we sat on the steps of my parents' home, and I was relaying the story, my brother looked at me in the eye and said, I could never do that. And I said, yes, you could. The human capacity, when you have to be there for a loved one, <clears throat> excuse me, allows you to do things that you just did not think that you could do. Yes. But I got news, you don't want to. No. Nobody plans to be a long-term family caregiver. No. And, and even if they plan for it, it's very tough to prepare for it because every caregiving situation is as unique as a fingerprint. What you did for mom is not what you do for dad, is not what you do for a spouse or, or a sibling. And... Um, very rarely do you see in caregiving a repetition of circumstances mm -hmm. that even give you a perspective other than the role itself and the responsibility that it brings to say, well, I did it here, I can do it again. It doesn't work that way. No, it doesn't. And a reminder to all of our listeners out there, uh, long-term care is not a benefit that is covered by Medicare. And this is when we're talking about not the flu, but something that's going to be long-term, such as uh, a heart attack, stroke, Alzheimer's. This is where we really see the costs and we see the stresses build. Uh, Brian, I had said to you earlier that I own a long-term care policy, as does my wife, and I mentioned that we've been seeing rate increases here in Florida. Uh, if you had the crystal ball, what do you see happening with the, the policies that are out there and the, the prices that people are paying? Well, the <coughs> we again, as a, as a subject we, we addressed a little bit earlier, um, I myself have had a rate increase for my policy that was fairly substantial. And I sympathize for all of you that are out there today who um, paid the premium, and in some cases over a number of years, um, you get a little bit older, uh, maybe you have a, a more fixed uh, income, and here comes a, a, an increase to your policy. Um, Say, having said that, I would strongly encourage you uh, all to continue to, to receive those uh, or, or pay those premiums so that you could receive those benefits. Um, but I know that the carriers are working extremely hard to try to match up the risk that they're willing to cover along with the price that they had. Um, you probably read a lot about the, the, some of the reasons for the increases, uh, people keeping their policy longer. Uh, in an interest rate environment that I don't think any of us thought that we would be in uh, for a long time. 
Um, and they're also finding the, the, that the utilization is higher too. So as I talk to the carriers and, and the, my colleagues at the Ash Brokerage talk to the carriers, uh, we push them really hard to make sure that what they're putting out to the public today uh, is a better risk uh, and price match so that we can try to avoid the increases in the future. Um, I know the state of Florida does a great job in trying to hold the carrier's feet to the fire, um, but the, I think the state uh, would also tell you that you need a viable long-term care market out there because, as you said, uh, Medicare will not pay for a substantial long-term care need, and frankly, none of us want to end up with Medicaid. Oh, absolutely not. Uh, we all have planning teams, go-to people, uh, as, as especially as we're going into retirement and through retirement. What is the role of, of the insurance professional? You mentioned you have up, up to 10,000 of them within the ASH organization. How do we best util utilize those people? Well, I, I think that with any advisor that you're working with, you certainly should, should encourage the, the, it to be an interactive process, a, a holistic process. You know, a lot of times uh, we'll find advisors that want to focus on uh, income and, and maximizing the income within the assets, and, and I think that's important for anybody's plan. But at the same time, as you look at your risk profile as we get past 65, 70, 75, um, that issue of what happens if I get sick becomes a more dominant discussion and a, certainly a dangerous adversary for all that you've saved in it for your income. So a, a, a broader approach of looking at all of your risk factors within your financial plan I think is very important. Do you feel that the broker today or the advisor today is really as trained and aware as they should be of the retirement and the long-term risks that their clients may encounter. I, I've seen in the past, and, and I mean this with the greatest respect, that they're reactive to situations. It took a long time, for argument's sake, for financial planners to think about the fact that their clients had kids going to school. And retirement has, has, is one thing. But long-term care and planning for the long-term event can be a difficult thing to bring up when you're dealing with a healthy 65-year-old who's trying to be prudent, but yet may not have encountered or pictures themselves as somebody who is in a facility or encountering a long-term health care event. And where do you see the advisor walking the fine line between scaring them and being pragmatic? Well, that's a good question. I, I would say this. I, I find, um, especially here in South Florida, but also throughout the country, I think advisors are beginning to realize and are educating themselves on the impact of caregiving, a care event, um, and I think they're beginning to do a better job of addressing the issues. Uh, I think for a long time, um, advisors probably weren't as educated in it, and, and maybe they would shy away from it. Say maybe you don't need it, or you know, it's it's, it's something that you don't have to consider. But what I tell folks is, and, and I've, my experience goes back to 1984 in this particular arena, that uh, the biggest change I've seen is that if I uh, address a, a, a group of individuals about the, the need, um, what I find is most of the general public would, would acknowledge today that, yeah, this really could happen to me. Ten years ago, 80, 90 percent of the room said, ah. Not me. I'm not, no, no, I'm healthy enough. It's going to be the other guys. Right. I'm the Pepsi generation. Right. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and so, and, and what that has done, that, that change in attitude has driven individuals to their advisors to, to almost demand, hey, I, I, I want to uh, look at this particular subject and discuss it. And it's caused them to have to be educated. Oh, okay. no, no doubt about that. Uh, when we talk about long-term care, we often hear the phrase activities of daily living and th those being the triggers of when this policy can begin to uh, go into claim. Can you talk a little bit about those? Yes. The, um, and, I, and I addressed a little bit earlier four different ways that you potentially could solve a, a, a long-term care need. 
um, in the triggers, and by the triggers I mean uh, by qualifying for the benefits that happens um, with all the products in the same way. It happens one of two ways. Uh, either you have a cognitive impairment, which Alzheimer's dementia, or that you have the inability to do two of six activities of daily living. Now, what are those activities of daily living? Well, those are the normal um, activities that you might do in the home, transferring, eating, bathing, uh, toileting, you know, uh, where you're trying to be active there in the home. And if you can't do two of the six, or you have, it's not and, but or you have a cognitive impairment, you would trigger the benefits within a long-term care policy. And Did when it, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. when they're triggered, what then is the role of the insurance professional? Well, um, that's, that's a tough question, and I say that because um, in years past, the insurance professional you would usually be involved in the process. Um, but some of the carriers have kind of stepped forward and said, hey, let us, let us deal with that particular claim situation. Um, but where I think the, the insurance professional needs to be involved is he needs to remind um, the individuals the actual benefits of the policy. And I certainly in, in will remind all of your listening audience um, to remember that they probably have a waiting period before benefits start. Mm -hmm. Okay, Often they, they are as long as 90 days. And I think people, when you buy a long-term care policy and it's 15, 20 years later, they tend to forget that that waiting period is there. So the, the insurance professional certainly could explain that period of time. Uh, and then the benefits that you have. One last thing, and I, I would say this to all of you out there, that if all of, if, if for those who have already made that decision and maybe made a purchase, please, for goodness sakes, make sure that your neighbors and your kids understand that you've already done this planning. Because I see all too often that we're, we're 10, 15, 20 years, 25 years down the line, uh, and an individual gets sick, um, they need care, and somebody's forgotten that the policy is stuck in the uh, in top safety. drawer. Yeah. 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 David, I interrupted you before. What did no, you no, want to no, ask? No, no, no. That, that was all right. I, I, was, I was talking about the fact that, um, and I was going to ask you about the elimination period, because a lot of people think the minute that you're diagnosed, uh, that starts things. But, um, but the sooner that you contact the insurance company and let them know that you're having an event, and clock at, starts least running. At, at least let the clock start running. Uh, rather than try and convince them retroactively yes. uh, that it started 90 days ago. Well, here's, here's and you, that is a really good point that you guys make. Um, because, because, as I said a little bit earlier, I don't like to think about it, but yes, I've been doing this since 1984. And, but, but back in the, the 80s, late 80s, and 90s, you know, we were talking about, about planning for this and, and looking at the different product features and stuff. But today, people are actually using the benefits. And I, I often I'll have an advisor call and say, uh, you know, I've got a client. We think that, they're, that it's pretty close. And, and I'll talk to the family. And the, the family will say, well, you know, you know we've got the kids around. And we, we've got some money in the bank. And so what we're going to do is we're going to hold the policy benefits back. You know, and, and then when we need them, then we'll try to right. revoke them. And I strongly encourage you not mm -hmm. to do so. Right. No Even if you have a limitation on two, three, it may not be a lifetime policy, but since we can't predict the outcome of diseases, all right, not to use the benefit while the benefit's available, and then worry afterwards where the tail of that disease may go, AIL, -A um, I think is, it makes good sense. And I, I also remember, because back in the late 80s, I was involved with a long-term care insurer that bought my company. So I had a very intimate look in 89 through 98 in exactly what was happening in long-term care. And, and it was like the Wild West then. Any company got in, they would sell. The presumption was that you retired at 65, you bought your condominium in Florida, you took two cruises, you played a bunch of golf, and at 72 you were dead, and you probably never had to trigger the benefit. And that was kind of the working joke. And uh, that's no longer the case. 
Uh, medicine today has allowed us to kind of jump over Darwin. We don't die at 72. We get to 92. And along the way, due to the healthcare system being able to medically keep us alive, even notwithstanding Paul's prior discussion about the right to die, most of us, if we get a chronic illness, are going to be around for a while. And we're going to run up expenses, and it's going to be something that's going to impact us from a quality of life whether that's financial, emotional, or in any other way. And why wouldn't you want to have as many things in place in advance that help you to mitigate the impact on your quality of life, including long-term care insurance or these other insurance products that allow you to draw down in unique events such as dementia or diminishment of activities of daily living and give you the ability to say, hey, I got benefit out of my life insurance policy before I died. It allowed me to have a better quality of life while I was sick. You know, guys, this is about control. And what I, what I often will say to individuals is put yourself in the catbird seat. You, you did the prudent thing. You, you have coverage. So make sure that you, you get that process started satisfy your elimination period, and then you decide which benefits that you then take um, from that carrier, uh, not the other way around. Right. Uh, makes absolute sense. Uh, going back to the days, Brian, when I was uh, in practice in family office, uh, one of the things we encouraged our clients to do was they did annual gifting to their children, uh, pretty much all the way down the line. And we had suggested that rather than send them a check for ten or eleven thousand dollars, which they typically would, kids would go on a cruise or something like that. Why not fund a long-term care policy for them so that it would be something that they would have for the rest of their lives? Talk about that a little bit. In, in fact, earlier you told us a little story about I related did, to that. I, I did. I, I would strongly encourage uh, individuals to consider that as an option because it's a. That, um, that's kind of the gift that gives for a very long time and has and can have an enormous positive impact in, in, in folks' mm -hmm. life. Um, we did talk a little bit earlier. Um, uh, I am a very big believer that as a, a family talks about the, the issue of caregiving and living longer, that uh, we, we definitely need to really focus on, on the wife um, because I hate to say it, guys, but we tend to be the ones that go sick and I, uh, first. And, and I know in, in both your cases that that's not necessarily the case. But I think um, most people would tell you that, that the odds are that we'll get sick first. And, and our spouses t tend to take care of us. But then we go and, and they're left by themselves. So um, years ago I was talking to a couple and it was a husband was rather stubborn. And uh, I said to him, look. Your wife desperately needs the, a plan for caregiving. And uh, he said, well, what are you talking about? And I said, well, you know, Valentine's Day coming up. I, <laughs> I said, uh, have you gotten her anything for Valentine's Day? And he said, boy, you'll stop at nothing, will you? <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I said, look, I said, this is the third seminar that, that I've done for the general public. And I said, she brings you every time. And you always tell me you're never buying. And then you guys walk away and you show up. I said, you know, Valentine's Day, I said, why don't you get her card, tell her that you're going to buy her her, her long-term care, and I'll make you this promise, that, uh, that, that if it doesn't work out, I'll, I'll make sure that, that, that uh, any money goes back to you, but I, more importantly, I will apologize on your behalf, and I'll, I'll tell her it was my idea. So, of course, I shoot my mouth off and kind of forget about it, and a couple, maybe 10 days, a couple weeks later, it's Valentine's Day morning. My phone rings in my office at 8.05. I pick the phone up, and it's the husband on the line mm -hmm. who says, my wife is in tears. And I went, oh, no. <laughs> I said, really? There goes really? the sale. <laughs> yeah, I really thought she wanted this. And he goes, no. She's not in tears because she's upset at me. She's in tears because she cannot believe that I would put my personal belief aside and do something so selfless than to make sure that she has coverage, um, maybe long after I'm gone, and I'm calling to say thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Wow. That, that's a great Valentine's that's story. That's a great husband. Yeah. It really is. All right. But Did you know, that you <laughs> never know the impact that those things have, not only directly as a policy, but the thought and the motivation behind saying to somebody, I want you to be protected. I care about you enough to, to make that difference. And, and rather than roses and another box of candy, here's something that'll be for you, even if I'm not here, to be here for Self you. Self-completing plan. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you can't beat it. But uh, an important question I want to ask you, Brian, uh, and I know Ash is a very responsible company and they really care about their insurers and their agents, but every so often we come across situations where things go awry and there's problems in, in, in claims having nothing to do with Ash. If somebody finds themselves in difficulty and struggling uh, to get their long-term care policy to pay, how do those issues get resolved? Well, um, certainly um, we're available if, if, um, if someone has a particularly difficult time. Um, we'll be more than happy to, to help um, somebody guide the, through the process. Um, if you're trying to handle it to begin with, the first, the very first thing that, that I encourage folks to do is understand your policy benefits. Um, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about all policies have a, or most anyway, have a waiting period. Understand how long that is and how it actually works. Um, you might want to understand your, your uh, language itself. But as someone who had a great aunt I helped out with, um, you certainly you want to understand what you have, but you want to hold that carrier, insurance carrier's feet to the fire. Uh, if you have a particularly tough time and you're very frustrated, Certainly the Department of Insurance is available uh, for you to reach out. Um, but let me say this in defense of the industry. Uh, my experience, and I'm... Been in it I, since 84. Yeah, long time. <laughs> um, the, the, the major carriers that are out there, um, by and large, and nobody's perfect, um, have a pretty good reputation of helping people. Um, fact, I actually heard a story yesterday where... Uh, you know, qualified long-term care claim um, so that the benefits are income tax-free have to be certified that your condition will la last at least 90 days. And I heard a story yesterday about a very well-known carrier um, who actually helped an individual not too long ago um, get that 90-day certification. It was kind of close, uh, but the carrier coached the individual and the individual's family to make sure that they would have the coverage and that carrier actually had to pay the claim. It was a good story. That, that is a good story. That's an advocate. That Boy, that is. That Let me ask you this question. We all know that up in Pennsylvania, under the tutelage of the Attorney General, mm -hmm. is kind of the elephant graveyard for those yes. uh, insurance companies that didn't make it, all right, went bankrupt or went in receivership, whatever the case may be. And that one of the things they've been doing uh, with clients is getting into the business of trading off. Yes. Trading off a premium increase for a reduction right. in coverage, either by dollar amount per day or length of time that coverage uh, will be mm -hmm. in included. And in getting people in a position who really may have benefited from what they bought, having to kind of get into an annual horse trade. Yeah. Um, and uh, while I understand the economics of it, how do you view it from an ethical perspective that we get into having to, you know, trade off what we thought we bought for something that winds up not being ultimately what we bargained for? Um, you know, very truly, I have a, a difficult time with the ethics of it. I mean, um, you know, we live in a great country, and, uh, you know, if you go to a, a restaurant and get a good meal, you expect a, a good meal for what you're willing to pay. You buy a car, you expect a good car for what you pay. And, and um, certainly on the, the what makes long-term care particularly interesting is that that's usually a 25 or 30 year process, mm -hmm. right? You're, you're, you're looking out into the future. So from a standpoint of um, the one side of the horse trading, I that's, that's that's difficult. From the practical standpoint though, um, you know, if you've 
you've made that investment, you've made those premiums, you find that you really can't pay that increase, then you, you absolutely have to know what you're getting into if you do that horse trade. Because uh, in some cases, if you, if you change a particular benefit, what might happen is that you might revert to the very first day of benefits. And, and the example is this, that um, many policies were bought with a COLA adjustment. Right, cost, cost of living, living adjustment. Cost of living adjustment, correct. And in some cases, with, I know some of the carriers say to you that if you're down the line and you want to do a horse trade and you give up your COLA, so that your policy may have started at 150 a day, it's now 300 a day, but the, the process of giving up that COLA sends you back to the 150 a day. Oof. You need to be educated and you need to, wow. be, to make sure that you understand what your choice is and how that impacts. Brian, we have but a few minutes before we wrap up. What last words would you like to give our listening audience to take with them as we wrap up today? I will tell you what I, uh, I always tell groups that I speak to. Um, this is never about long-term care insurance. It's just not. Now, I happen to believe that uh, looking at your options uh, as part of the process makes sense. And that doesn't cost you anything. But it is about a plan. And all of us out there, as individuals, as couples, as families, ought to have an idea of what our plan is going to be as our loved ones age. That's the first thing. And the second thing is then you should share that with the community around that particular individual. Thanks. We appreciate it, Brian. Right. David, do you want to wrap it up? Yep. I want to also thank very much uh, one of our sponsors, Arden Court. I was there this morning doing a uh, Alzheimer's dementia support group. They are excellent. Uh, they are on Jog Road, just south of Linton Boulevard. And if you get a hold of Marsha Teal, 561-498-5552. She is just the consummate authority on everything that has to do with dementia. She'll answer your questions, whether you want to sign up to have a loved one be there or not. She's great. That's Marsha Teal, and that's 561-498-5552. I don't care where you are in the country. She'll be happy to come and answer your questions. And also, Scott Solkoff, one of the leading elder law attorneys in the United States, writes the books for West Elder Law. His dad started the elder bar here in Florida. Just a great guy on Atlantic Avenue in Delray. If you're in Pittsburgh, I know that doesn't mean anything, but 561-733-4242, 561-733-4242. If you want the best, that's the number to call. And so America, South Florida, the world, you've heard another Caregiver Reality Session. I want to thank you so much, Brian, for being here. You've really helped to explain and take some of the mystery out of long-term care insurance and caregivers. Remember, next Tuesday, Drive Time, Caregiver Reality Hour, we'll be back here. Paul? Again, thank you, Brian. And to our listeners, have a great week. And caregivers, take care of yourselves. See you next week. Thanks for joining us for this week's Caregiver Reality Show. Each week, David Levy, a gerontologist, and Paul Badiato, a caregiver expert with a combined over 25 years of experience providing practical and realistic help to caregivers struggling to keep up with the needs of a loved one who are unable to care for himself or herself. To reach David Levy, email him at david at caregiverreality.com. Or to reach Paul Vadiato, email paul at caregiverreality.com. And find out more online. Just go to caregiverreality.com. See you next week for another exciting show of Caregiver Reality. <laughs>